What happened when I wrote a sci-fi adventure with an AI droid? The cargo ship hovering over the dusty landing site blew sand particles into its space suit and helmet. He didn't feel the grit when he threw it, but he heard it bounce off his fortified skin. John Renard rolled his head forward and marched out of the shuttle bay, his helmet still in place. Status, Torres, he mumbled into his phone. Reading you fine, Captain, Torres sounded in his earpiece. Sensors are showing eight miles of desert, sir. Nothing living for miles. Caldotrans has landed in the middle of nowhere. Good, Renard muttered under his breath. He was strapped to his suit with six pieces of equipment. One was a three-foot rifle that displayed terabytes of data on his lenses. The burn marks, cracks and bruises on the spacesuits told John they were fresh from combat or wounded, but he can't see any signs. The visor had been placed on the front panel and the visors had been placed over the front panel. John doesn't know the names, he doesn't know if the strangers were crammed into the back of a metal box or if they had fallen on the red planet. He doesn't know their names or where they were born, only that he knows they are foreigners. John knew it was his job to scan the corpses. He didn't see the blood, but some of the brown must be from staining. He checked the cracks, checked some of the pieces of equipment, and some of the pieces of equipment. One of the lenses on his equipment would be able to detect any fatality, determine some of the cause of death, and see the actual pits of the red planet. In the satellite view, he saw a small circle, which was about 700 meters from the large circle, where the ship was on the red planet. In the satellite view, only the shadows of the ship on the red planet were seen. A hose fell into the hold and sucked the dead out of the just-emptied compartment, and it rolled into a car loaded with black, sealed body bags. A dozen warriors hobbled out, trudging through the sand, trudging more grit over each other so that the ubiquitous wind could catch them. The burn marks, cracks and bruises on the spacesuits told John they were fresh from combat or wounded, but he can't see any signs. The visor had been placed on the front panel and the visors had been placed over the front panel. John doesn't know the names, he doesn't know if the strangers were crammed into the back of a metal box or if they had fallen on the red planet. He doesn't know their names or where they were born, only that he knows they are foreigners. They even piled up the bodies, which did not help in salvaging the sandblasting of the wind, no matter how short they were. The blown-up transport, the man told the veteran, but they still left on the shuttle. It was the only way from this planet, and it was only a few hundred kilometers away, not even a hundred miles. Renard slung the explosive device over his shoulder and shuffled toward the main camp, and the wind lifted and doused his new uniform with red sand. Chapter 2 Rewriting of Chapter 2 The Sun is the same from Earth as Mars, but it marches in circles around the nine planets and Pluto, which orbits within its system. The rotation of the planet corresponds to that of our home world, so that the glowing sphere appears on the eastern horizon, which would be our home. It turns red and casts a glimmer of color over the valley floor below, and the light glistens like a crest of mineral formations. The ground beneath their feet was slippery and unsafe as they climbed the ridge, but Renard could not hear the crunch of his boots in the sand, nor could he feel the cold, wet sand beneath his feet, only the warm, salty air. Although his suit was air-conditioned and sealed, he was sweating from the heat of the sun and the cold, salty air in the air above his head and body. Water vapor would collect from his breath, sweat, and even urine if he bothered to make one, but it would be recycled for recreation. He missed a step or a foot and water dripped down his face and fell on the moisture collector who was working overtime to dehumidify the air. The comb hit him and he thought he was drinking his own pee, so he hit the comb. As he got caught dangling on a rock in the dirt, Renard flipped over and jumped up. He stared into the red sky and came to a halt, with his back to the sky, and stared at him for a few seconds, then back at his feet. Squadron leader Desmond Harper stood on top of the ridge and spread his legs in a secure posture that looked like a pirate king surveying his territory. The rest of his crew spread out around him, ten nervous men staring at their leader. Desmond stretched out a fist to grab her attention, and a man's helmet found its way up to her head. Desmond did not want to think about it, although he was sure that they were using shortwave, a closed loop, for encrypted digital signals that could not be captured with a single call from a receiver. Command, he said to himself, his voice as loud as the wind in his hair and as clear as a bell. Hell knew it, they always seemed to be on patrol, ready for an ambush but perhaps they were listening for a moment. Desmond made a graceful jump, landed next to Renard and pushed him forward, his head on a swivel joint, his field of vision limited by the helmet. He pulled the slider on the back of his pack and waited until he reached 20 feet before getting the other man to follow him. The front of his first suit was cut out of a massive helmet designed to withstand the immense pressure of the atmosphere. The design was better than the first generation, but it looked like a fish shell welded together into a bubble. This iteration, the third or fourth version, 
looked like it had welded fish shells together and formed bubbles. It was virtually impossible for him to fight well, and he looked down on himself, his eyes wide open in shock when he saw all this. He pressed the carbon dioxide filter of his suit against his chin and pulled his fingers to the handle of the gun. He looked at his whole body, which was upside down, and even now a leak crept up on him. Although everything he knew had disappeared, he still had to watch it, even though he couldn't even breathe. The radio link was open, and paranoia was an early sign of a gas mixture problem, but he didn't even notice. He spotted something half buried in the sand in front of him and reached out his fist to signal him to stop before falling to one knee. When someone was attacked, they would grunt, shout or make noise, but no one would hear them. Desmond marched towards him, falling on his back, knees, head in hands. I can't see what you're talking about, but I'm pretty sure it's not the same as the one above, he muttered, eyes wide open. Renard raised one hand and pointed to Desmond with the other, which he held tightly in his hand like a gun. Desmond followed the instructions and stood up, wide-eyed with fear and fearlessness, as he followed Renard's instructions. His face was withered and mummified, staring through a broken face pane as he marched out of his space suit and onto the sand dunes at the naval base. The explosive engineer burned his face, mouth open in a permanent scream and his eyes wide open, as if he had been burned by an explosive engineer. Desmond clicked on the communicator and typed in the request, I won't hurt you, he leaned forward to capture the signal recovery sign. If you do it as I say, you may live another day or two, but if you don't, I have to do what I said and you will live maybe a day or two. Renard saluted, adding before leaving the valley, get the grazing animals up here to show you the new meat to kill. Renard trudged forward and trudged, but lost his footing in the loose sand. This time he slipped down the slope, landed on the ground and lost his footing again. Desmond jumped up and climbed up the hill, but the grazing animals crowded around him, and he had to jump down and climb down. Renard told him his name was painted in block letters on the sleeve of his suit, and he looked up to the other long-distance runners in his team. He didn't want to know, because one of those scaly bastards was there with two clicks. The grunting in the space suit carried a few burns, but Renard told him to paint the name in blocks of letters over the sleeves of the suit. The Grotz man marched up, stood thirty feet away from the group, but the rest of the team ignored him as the last man standing. The simulation never ended, and they pushed Renard out and pushed him away, then back into the simulation, back to the other side. Renard nodded, checked his feet, and Weber typed in the ad, but the reflective protection on Weber's face paled in comparison to what he could see from it. His piercing blue eyes stood in stark contrast to the dark brown of his hair and the bright blue of the sun's rays. Mars doesn't have an atmosphere like we do at home, but I don't think it will hurt to be further away. If you play too much Gamma, you can release it at the end of the day, just like on Earth, and I'm sure Mars does. One of my relay colleagues rushed back to Weber, and his face darkened to show a bone etched in granite. He scratched his name on his sleeve and rummaged through his hastily drawn replacement. Weber smiled, put his hand on Renard's shoulder and began to move him forward with the rest of the group. The day went on for a few more hours until we were all back in camp, ready for the next day's relay. I don't know when we're done or if we need more but I'm sure there's a leak where we've caught it taking the device out of our hands. Chapter 3 Rewriting of Chapter 3 In the late afternoon, just before dark, I met the rest of my group, 15 soldiers and 12 men, who defeated me. From the perspective of the wide horizon, the Martian desert seemed insignificant to me, and less so from the perspective of the people beyond. The troops worked with buckets to dig fox holes in the sand, and we formed a small group of four or five men, one for each side of our group. The open radio link meant we had to pass the side of the other marines in our company. The silence, grunting and breathing worked, but the alternative was a mess as they tried to click their way through different channels. Here we come, said one of the suits, and I stood up next to my company commander, the name Burley up his sleeve. We were rolled over and thrown off, three reservoirs thrown into the sand and small geysers rising, adding grit to the wind. The marines had stopped when a tiny hoverjet rolled over the horizon and got into position. The role-playing game zoomed over the hills behind it, flapping its wings and lighting the sky in glowing fireballs. From his position, Cree watched the hovering flight, Jet raced past us, his eyes wide open as he saw him racing towards us. The commander returned to his foxhole, and I received a call from headquarters. I know you are here, but I am sorry that I have to return. At the edge of the perimeter, Weber instructed Renard and Bellhop to widen the hole they had dug, and the three worked together. Weber drew a number in the sand and pointed to it with the tip of a shovel, and Renard wanted to join the man who had shown him the first kindness he had seen on this hard planet. He had known it first, friendliness in training, but he didn't want to have a man like that, even if he had been shown some of it in training. 
After the rest of the group switched off the radio, Reynards tapped on his headset and Bellhop clicked the communication channel to a new frequency. Bellhops tapped him in the arm to do the same, and both nodded. The music rang out as the other men on the team dug the next hole, and Renard thought of a six-foot deep grave. After some rough measurements, the hole was finished and the music stopped, but not before Reynards thought about it for a moment. They began covering the walls with plastic alloys to seal the Martian floor, and he railed, I've never seen such a structure. He fell with his back to the wall into the hole, hands on hips and feet on the ground. Bellhop said, this little hole will be a piece of heaven for you tonight and you can breathe in the fresh air and lie down. I know how to grunt, I'm not bad at it, but this will be the best place I've ever been. The two men laughed together, the kind of laugh that comes from a casual sense of familiarity. They laughed so much that they stopped laughing when Commander Cree heard music on the headset frequency. Eight weeks ago, there was no music in the air, only the sound of his own voice and that of other people's voices. Desmond and Burley left the outpost they had built and went outside. The three men looked around and began to attract attention, particularly Desmond and the other two men in the group behind them. One struck back the reflective visor of the Cree's windshield and, with the troop leader in tow, headed for the next hole. If you get a visit tonight, I want to know what you got into, he said. Rewriting of Chapter 4 At the edge of the perimeter sits a man in a spacesuit with a body that fits like hardly any other and a vibrating shovel that moves with practiced ease. The name Gear was etched on the side of his suit, along with his name and the name of a group of other people. He dug a deep hole in the sand, pulled out an explosive device and pulled it out. He saw an empty landscape and lay down in the sand, face down to the desert, lying, on the ground, with his back to the wall of the hole. Renard was preparing to jump when he squeezed out a combo and fell into the foxhole he had just completed. He did not fall asleep, but fell asleep in the middle of the desert, with his back to the wall of his foxhole, face down, to the ground, lying, on his back. Desmond barked over the radio, Renard looked over to Weber and gave a gloved thumbs up, then back to Weber, eyes wide open. Weber pushes the control panel to the side of the plastic wrap, and before Renard can even strut around, he is covered in a layer of dust. A pale energy bowl that hides everything behind it like opaque glass, but is only a few centimeters thick. There is a fox pit that serves as a command center, and he sees other solitary bodies scattered in far-off lines. He trudges to the gearbox position and waves to the passers-by, but there is no sign of him. Renard marches to a corridor in the frame, holds it for a click, then it goes on. He scrapes a hole with his shovel, kneels down and lies down to observe the darkness. As the sun drifts over the horizon, shadows cast over the valley and plunge in at dusk. There is a faint filtered atmosphere, the pollution that hides behind the faint glare, but the stars that dive into the desert in soft white glow bring everything to life. Renard lies down on the floor and watches in the dark until everything is finished, eyes wide open. He wondered how long the first guard had lasted and what would come to relieve him, but he did not know much about licking. Most of them would have been 1.80 meters tall, if the hologram had been correct and he had known the world. It had come from Planet 9, a dark planet discovered by scientists as it orbited Pluto after its expulsion from planetary ethics. It was discovered by a scientist who had been orbiting Pluto. He had been a child when the shuttle crashed into Central Park and told the world about the universe and its tiny city. Renard didn't care, it wasn't about saving the Earth, it was just about the survival of humanity and the preservation of his family. He found out how the government had taken over SpaceX and Boeing during the war under the Critical Domain Clause, and then rewarded owners and shareholders with trillions of dollars worth of contracts. The war on Mars was a war for the planet, the rich stayed in the safety of their homes and worked on building the city's protective ramparts, and the poor were drafted in and drafted in. The arms companies became rich by providing poor quality weapons, shelter, and food to poor idiots who were driven to the red planet to fight for a way of life they had never enjoyed. He couldn't put a vacuum seal on his office, but he could put food from Mars atmosphere on his helmet by hand. He could help those who spent their first night in the sun, stop the invasion and keep them off the planet, and he had to do that. He studied the desert, imprinting the contours of the rocks and the shapes that the sand created. He really tried to keep his eyes moving as he had been taught, but the darkness and numbing pain in his stomach preoccupied him. He was thinking about how many ridges he had to walk to reach this position, and he thought of his home from day one. He thought about the instruments he was taught in training to keep his mind focused and relaxed. Inhale and exhale, he practiced, breathed, breathed and breathed until his eyes remained closed while he put on his helmet. He could not move his legs, but he could not move his arms, hands or feet, not even a bit, because of the pain in his back. He knew he had been cast in another shade, but he just couldn't raise him anymore. The wind had created a makeshift dune in which he could hide his body, 
from which he grew, and all that concealed him was his helmet and his torso. Ten meters before him, the starlight was blocked by a shadow, and his eyes tracked the rocks on the horizon in search of them. Renard looked down at the connection embedded in his helmet, then back to the stars. He moved his huge mustache, a helmet-shaped helmet over his head, and circled the dune. He would have been heard in the distance if it had not been for his own voice in his head, which sounded a warning, no. The second one disappeared into the darkness, and a number of them approached him slowly, one after another, slowly but surely, until they were almost gone. He wanted to move the eyed and fire a shot to get there, maybe he wanted to warn the others, but he didn't want to. He took one, while the other opened the vice and killed it, and then another took it down, opened the vice and killed it. He felt the weight of the water on the sand when it fell, he almost crushed the giant with his leg, but he could not. The second leak stopped in front of him, his eyes glued to his leader's back, the red lights on Renard's helmet flashing and bouncing off his visor. Lick jumped back and swung his blaster up and down, but the laser was on third and hit him in a puff of smoke. Leek jumped up again, his eyes wide open, and the lasers were pointed at him, striking him with plumes of smoke. The leader swung around and fired into the valley, and the force of the explosion caught the man in the shoulder and turned him over. Renard screamed through the headset as he fired back, but the device pierced the chest plate and he rolled all the way over. The leader fired in a depression and his head hit the ground, his eyes wide open and wide, eyes wide open. An explosive bolt struck Renard in the back and ripped open his air tank, and an explosive mixture of air burst into the atmosphere, hurling the gear bearings that carried it around the perimeter into the air. The marines fired back, creating a web of laser beams that answered the shadow at the border. A flickering field of force collapsed in a shower of dust and the air gasped as bodies boiled in foxholes. Renard watched as blue stars appeared in his eyes as he struggled for air and the pressure on his head rose. A red mist sprayed from the blood vessels of his nose and out of sight but his eyes were blocked and he could not see. He put the plaster back on, grabbed it and rolled it on his back with his hands in front of his face. He cut the damaged pipes with a laser knife and circled the second air tank, but the regulator was damaged and had to be reinstated. Weber jumped out with the gun, hit him in the shoulder and gave a thumbs up, but Renard didn't answer I'll buy it as quickly as a second. He sucked air into his suit, which filled the tank and held it in plaster, and ran for the IEDs around. He pushed and rolled until he felt he could breathe, but by then it was too late, he could not breathe. Lix lost the element of surprise and disappeared again into the stylistic darkness of the Mars desert. Desmond held the eye to his hip as he approached the dead, but there were no wounded marines around him. Spy Burley raised a finger and made a hand gesture that caught the attention of Weber and Bellhop. Commander Cree slipped next to Desmond and they both looked up as the marines retreated to safety from their foxholes. They reached the aisles and spotted a few more marines in the back of the store, all with their hands in their pockets. Let's see what we have in common with the rest of the marines at the back of this shop, not just one or two, but a whole lot of them. Cree and Desmond were heading toward the foxhole when Weber and Bellhop reached it, but no one gave Renard an order. He didn't know what to do, so he slipped to the edge of the foxhole and sat down in the corner. A long, thin body jumped out and lay down in the hallway, and a short time later another. The leaks had matching space suits and recognizable air packs, but he couldn't see his trademark mustache. They had all been iced over on the plastic, covered in soil and torn open by nasty-looking pressure wounds. I walked on, Desmond said, wide-eyed with surprise at the sight of the two men in front of him and the three men behind him. Renard struggled to get up, but Bellhop grabbed him and lifted him off the wall into a more comfortable position. He cowered next to Renard, went through the walls and bent down to examine the prisoner. How much was left, how much was left, and how long was he dead, or how many days, weeks, or months? Renard pulled a second pack out of the tube and studied the reading, and Bellhop laughed and shook his head. He pulled an air canister from his backpack and passed it on, and Renard studied his reading. Desmond finished questioning the prisoner and he knew where to sleep, but he owed it to his people, damn it, to him. He dragged himself out of the hole and hung one arm out for a lick, but two marines, Tay, and Stoker, jumped with him. He jumped out of the hole, followed by Cree, and Desmond stared at Renard and Bellhop from the corner of his eye for a few seconds, then back at Cree and Stoker. Rewriting of Chapter 5 Weber waited until the other two Marines jumped back down before dropping the lid on the perimeter. He activated the force field and made a circular motion with his hand, and Weber and I both nodded. Weber crawled over and plopped back into his lap, and Renard took off his top and had it unbuttoned. Bellhop leaned forward and wrapped his face, a quick hiss from his helmet filling the tiny bubble. Weber crawled back to me and I plopped back on Weber's lap, and he had his back against me. Since we lost all integrity, 
we had about five seconds to lock ourselves in a back and forth fight between the two of us for the rest of the night. The mood in the foxhole was joyous, as the survivors of the attack were relaxed and happy to be alive and alive. Renard looked around for the name on his sleeve and tried to match it to a face he could remember. Weber Bellhop leaned against the wall to the side, his carbon black skin contrasting with his pale blue eyes. Hey the goat, red beard from the wilderness of the south, sat absent, with a grin on his face. Wang sat alone in the corner, crouched and bent over, shouting at Renard for a moment, Renard. I didn't have a horn but I needed a rest and the last time I slept after an attack, Stoker hit the back of my elbow. I was in a state of mind, Leroy said in a soft voice, but we were both in very different states, and that was the reason. Renard opened the MRI and placed it on his leg, but did not want to pull the man out. The first bag was probably still in the wind, and he had forgotten a little more until he was again supplied with supplies. He reached for the hard bread while he was working on repairing the slider, but the scheme on the inside flap of his suit did not match the reality of the regulator's work. He pulled the button out of his lap and began to work on it with fast, precise movements that were far too rehearsed. The supplier had confused the contract and combined the wrong suit with a cheaper, less reliable regulator. I had nothing to exchange here and no one would help me pay the price. I was afraid that the old man would ask me. I don't know shit, but I want to live two weeks so I can learn something and then we go home. Bellhop said, I don't want you dead, send your children here, I don't know, you don't want me dead. The repaired speed control returned to Renard, who took off his helmet, put on his air pack and put it on. The violent man broke off and showered me with red dust, but as soon as I sealed everything, he broke free. Desmond fell into the hole, but then I shut my mouth and Sergeant got out and he fell back into his air pack. Weber saluted as his windshield switched to reflector mode, but something else overshadowed the joyous mood. Renard watched for a moment, then climbed out of the hole, and the men inside did the same, one by one. Chapter The sunrise on Mars happened abruptly. The sun rolled up over the horizon spreading a bright band of light that marched like a line across the sand. Renard saw the glow pass over his feet and keep moving away from him and stopped to turn and stare. The burning orb reflected on the golden-tinted visor in his helmet. He turned back to point and kept moving through the sand, his footsteps a little more sure with experience, but still uncertain as he learned to move the weighted footplates in lyre gravity. The radio in his helmet sputtered. Hold up, Desmond instructed them. Renard stopped and lifted his blaster to the ready. Nothing moved in front of him. Just dunes, a hill, depressions and the rock full of dust and sand. Somewhere past the nothing was the lion's den. Beachhead. Weber. Stoker. Move up. Triangulate point. Weber and Stoker moved with graceful ease up to Renard and shifted ten paces to either side of him. Weber cleared his faceplate and shared a wink with Renard before going reflective again. I didn't see anything. That's just what they want you to see, said Stoker. Radio quiet, Desmond instructed. Let's go. They trio marched forward, slower this time as they searched the ground ahead of him. PSSST, Weber hissed over the radio and they froze. He slid across the sand to ease up next to Renard his blaster trained on a shadow under an overhanging rock. Renard spied the bunker dug into the ground and camouflaged with a hill of sand. Weber scouts the terrain, signals Desmond. Their leader edged up to the overhang, helmet on a swivel as he tried to keep eyes everywhere. The bunker could be a feint with licks hiding under the sand ready to pop up and ambush them. Or they could be waiting in the darkness ready to boil out like ants as soon as some silent trigger was released. Desmond motioned Renard to follow him in. The move to the edge of the of the overhang and peer under. It's a long shallow trench that runs along the length of the rock, carved out of the sand and extending in the darkness further than they can see. The rest of the squad pulls tighter to form a half circle around the trench. Half faced in, rifles held ready and the other half turned out, watching and waiting. Desmond clicked his radio. Weber silently slipped over the side of the hill and down into the trench. Another click sent Leroy and Wang to stand sentry on each edge of the trench, their faces hidden by visors. Wang fidgeted with his gear as he stood, checking his power clip, his air canister as his eyes roamed the darkness in the ground and the sun-drenched landscape around them. Weber dropped to his stomach and flashed a maglite off the end of his rifle barrel. The LED beam lit up the interior of the rock like a miniature sun. The light revealed more carved rock and a tunnel that extended even further. Weber crawled down the tunnel, his knees and elbows scratching a zigzag pattern in the dust. Desmond lowered his rifle and pulled a tablet out of a suit pocket. He keyed it and followed a glowing dot that represented Weber as he disappeared into the tunnel. Wang looked over at Leroy standing as still as a statue. 
Desmond keyed a button and a grainy video image from Weber's helmet transmitted back to him. The image washed over a figure leaning against the tunnel wall. The tip of his rifle moved toward it carrying the light further in to show it was a lick. Dead and mummified. A blast hole in the suit it wore. Weber crawled toward it, dragged the rifle off the body and kept advancing. Leroy glanced toward the other squad members as they watched the landscape. He turned back toward the trench. A lick popped out of a sand-covered tunnel in front of him. It blasted him backwards. The other marines in the squad hit the ground and returned fire. Desmond screamed for calm as the men blasted the ground around the lick, the rock overhang. The lick slid back into the tunnel and began to run into the darkness. A blast sent it out of the hole into the open, a smoking crater in its chest. Weber crawled out covered in sand and grime. Hold your fire, he keyed over the radio. Hold your fire. He climbed out of the second bunker entrance and knelt to check on Leroy. The lick hit him in the chest, almost the same spot where it took a round. He started stripping the supplies off the body. That tunnel branches off five times just in the leg I was in. If each of those five branches off again. His squadmates turn around to examine the land they just traversed. They could be surrounded by licks hiding in the sand ready to pop out or drag them down. They had no way of knowing, but it felt like they were in it pretty deep. Did you see a communications array? Desmond asked. Just because I didn't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. They could know we're coming. Or they might not communicate the way we do. This could be an independent unit, like us, working on its own for the same goal. Stopping us. Yes sir. Desmond turned to Renard and Tay. Sweep the perimeter. Everyone meet on my mark. Bring Leroy over here. Bellhop and Wang lifted Leroy's blasted body up by the arms and dragged him through the sand. They laid him down without ceremony in the trench by Desmond and turned back to watch with the others. Nothing stirred behind them except for the dust, the wind. Renard thought it was one of the weirdest things about being on Mars. The lack of sound. Sure it was easy to hear the breathing of his squadmates over the open communicator lines, but the wind on Earth would whistle, howl, or just rattle as it shifted over in and around things. Up here it all happened outside of his suit a self-contained little world that left him feeling disconnected from the environment. Not that there was much connection back in the atmosphere, but at least he could hear. It was one of the first lines of defense growing up on the streets. One developed a keen ear for danger approaching. Footsteps in the dark. The roar of a hoverjet engine as the homeless were hunted for conscription into the marines. Here there be dragons in silence. They couldn't hear them roar. Our mission may have been compromised, Desmond announced, his voice tight. They might be watching us now. We don't know. I need all eyes open. I need all periscopes up. We move in radio silence and fast. Our goal is that damn gun emplacement. If you are the last goddamn man standing, that you move for that gun and gut it. Got it? Yes sir, the radio squawked softly. Bellhop. Wang. Full point. The two marines checked the power packs on their rifles and began the slow jog across the sand, feet touching off little dust storms the wind picked up to carry across the valley floor. The rest of the men fell in with them. Run quiet. Run fast. Stay alert, Weber jogged next to Renard and clapped him on the shoulder. Then he was gone, moving ahead so that Renard could only see the sand-colored suit as they spread out. Rewriting of Chapter 7 I shuffled on as the turtle made a fast pace across the sand, wondering what the others thought of my noise. I tried to resist it, hoping to stave off the cramps when they came in, but the net by my side grabbed me like a vice. With every breath I took and exited, I heard the rustle of the sand and the sound of the turtle's breathing, as well as my own. I felt like I was reeling, and my internal compensators were working overtime against the heat that was growing in my suit. The sun was burning, but I thought it was hot, not cold, because I remembered the global warming of the sun on my skin, as well as the cold in the air. The ship creaked as the retro rocket fired sporadically to maintain its position, and I slept crammed into the back of the boat with hundreds of other recruits. After the hum of the ion engine in my bedroom stopped, I felt that the ship was leveling off in orbit. The red lights on the locked door began to buzz when a siren sounded from outside my ship. The simple door, which was supposed to allow only one man to pass through, was divided into sections in the event of a break-in. The men ran through the doors, bolted their helmets and grabbed their weapons, and the bodies piled up around the lock. Renard hit the ramp to the shuttle and made sure she was purple, running against Sergeant, who was shouting at her to run. One of the recruits grabbed her by the elbow with one hand and the other with the other, and she had to turn away from him. Renard, fully aware of the obvious, slipped out of his jumpsuit and clamped the straps tightly, and he slipped back into his suit. 
He checked the seals on his helmet as the shuttle's engines roared and took off from the deck. An enemy rocket smashed into the ship's door as it flew through, the concussion tossed it over the side of a ship and sent it into space. Renard felt the shuttle spinning and pushing him back in his seat as they raced toward the exit. The recruits inside were screaming as the sound in their sealed helmets included the sounds of the rocket exploding and the screams of their parents. Renard closed her eyes and saw the lifeless body of Sergeant trapped in a vacuum and not bouncing off the shuttle's fuselage. The pilot skidded, took off, jumped to the edge of the atmosphere and landed on the ground. The interior of Renard's shuttle rocked wildly, and the second shuttle sped uncontrollably toward her and Sergeant in the back of the shuttle. She could feel the missiles hitting the atmosphere as the pilot struggled for control, and her voice came through the headset. They approached, but she could only throw them through the edge that cut into her legs as they approached. Rewriting of Chapter 8 Captain Mike Dawson stared at the curvature of the red planet as his ship entered orbit. His young face shook with worry as he watched the atmosphere of the rocket crash onto the ship. A distress signal was sounded from the ship and a red light began to swing over the bridge, a second shouted in hand red. A rocket rose from the ship's battery and raced into the Martian atmosphere, an explosion shook the ships as the enemy rocket hit the hull. The shuttle bay was hit, the integrity of the fuselage was lost and seconds turned into minutes when the rocket slammed into the bridge. The shuttle bays had been hit and the ship's engine room was strewn with debris. Dawes climbed out and watched the smoldering carnage as smoke fell on him and shrapnel pierced the back wall and blasted into the headquarters. Anne, the communications officer, retreated to the station and switched on the radio with an automatic announcement. The hand rescue capsule repeated the loop in a loop for the next five minutes, until the last voice of Anne's voice echoed through the room. Dawes grinned briefly, and Dawson entered the coordinates of the bridge head into the landing. The first mate did not leave the station, but he grabbed Anne's ensign and pushed her through the corridor to the life ring. We've parachuted in and the command ship is ready, he shouted at Dawson. He shut down the computer, lit the ion engine that turned the vast world into a hell bunker in 90 seconds, and then ran over the bridge to join the others. He saw what would be his first and probably last command action, but then he locked and locked. The locks, designed to automatically slam on a section, whispered and eventually caused the fried computer systems to be rerouted and restarted. Dawson was sprinting towards the bridge when sparks flew from the walls and firecrackers fell from the ceiling. He walked past the two dead crew members, who had been eaten by the explosion, and into the bunker. He just managed to miss one of the life buoys, almost sacrificing one hand and racing towards the locks. He narrowly missed it as he hurtled towards the lock, almost sacrificing his one hand for it. Dawson raced towards the door but Columbus said there's no place here, and his first mate swung the hatch and turned it shut. The huge rocket veered off course and when it drilled directly into the red planet, it began to explode in flames and fireballs. Seven shuttle rescue capsules were launched into space when explosions and rocket fragments repeatedly hit the fuselage. Renard got up and got out, but he stopped and stared at the scorched, crumpled remains of the global thousands of feet scattered in the desert. That's what body bags are for, said the bellhop, and I let the whole squad do the talking, but I can't keep the chatter going. The rest of the crew fell to the ground as they searched the perimeter, but Weber fell over and turned around and fired as the leak slid back into the sand through the tunnel. A leak came out of the sand and blew Stoker out, I didn't get a shot in the back, he said. It was silent for a moment as he inhaled through his helmet and then the sound of his own breathing and that of the other crew members. He sees the sand swirl swirling around his body as the air is vented into the atmosphere. Renard hears the clanking of a leash and crawls out of the sand onto his smoking body. The suit is fused with his flesh and he can't even see through his helmet as he inhales and exhales. He is still alive, Renard hisses, but it is impossible that he is alive, his medical care and education have not caught up with him. His body floats in the air for a few seconds before bursting into flames. The expectation is that we will die or live if we are hit by Mars, but I don't want to die here, if I were alive, I could send you back on the shuttle. Weaver shuffled out of the sand tunnel into the hole, and the men waited and looked for more leaks, but no more. Weber reached the edge of the hole, pushed his gun into the sand and fired a few shots, but he reached out and pushed Renard aside so he could lean on Stoker. Bellhop slipped in next to Renard then pushed him to the side so he couldn't lean on Stoker's. Weber slipped off his side and landed on the ground with a flick, but landed next to him. Desmond jumped up and ran to his aid, and the two of them pitched up next to each other on the grounds and offered each other cover. As Weaver rolled upright and fired back, Desmond returned fire, and firecrackers roared through the darkness, spinning the sand beside him like glass. He rolled to his right and stared in disbelief at the black surface of the hole with his eyes wide open. The explosion filled the darkness with a flash of brilliant energy, and Heater grabbed Renard's arm and pulled him close. 
could you please make sure your legs are straight, he shouted, wide-eyed with fear in his own. He put a strong hand on Stoker's shoulder and pressed it down to assure him he was close. Desmond crunched the sand and knelt beside him, grinning and winking. Weber walked toward Renard, tapped him with the vice and grinned, then back to the heater. Renard patted his legs, arms and pockets, but all he had was a laser knife, and the fuckmed kid always let him down. He watched his eyes wander into the land of the dying, and then back to Renard's face, then to his own. Desmond cut himself with the blade, but Stoker grabbed the handle from Renard's hand and pressed it down on his neck. Weaver grabbed his arm and pulled it back, and he fell to his knees in front of him, hands in the air. Weber picked it up and handed it over to Bellhop, but Renard was gagged by his helmet, and Weber's helmet broke off. I can throw him at him and he can't get up, so I put my helmet around his neck and throw him down. Desmond stood up next to him and gave Renard the laser knife back, and he gave it back. His firearm was blown off, but the drug package had morphine, so his final minutes may be a little more relaxed. He did not belong here, but who cared if a bunch of aliens wanted to make this damn place his home, he was concerned for nothing more than his own safety. So let's blow the hell out of this goddamn laser bench and get the damn hell down from here, that's damn right. Bellhop grabbed Renard by the arm, picked him up, moved Stoker back and helped Weber dispose of the shares they split. Weber said, staring into the darkness of the red sand, that's it, we're picking them all up one by one. Desmond led them back to the tunnel and they were picked up by Bellhop, Weber, Renard, Stoker and the rest of their team. Rewriting of Chapter 9 As the sun settled lower in the Martian sky, the shadow of the earth brought with it the smell of burning facades and smoke. The damage was so minor and so severe that it would cause serious damage to the earth's atmosphere. The ship first hit the ground with its nose and tipped over, with the deck crumpled when the broken half fell to the side. The marines were able to view the space in the cargo bay that had entered the atmosphere and the debris field spread across the crater crust, making it difficult to cross in a straight line. Three shadows, soaked figures came out and fought each other on patrol to the side of the craters. One of them fell to the ground on a ridge of dunes created by the impact crater and came to rest on the ground. He wore an inappropriate spacesuit, which was sealed with the atmosphere as he hurriedly dressed him for a quick escape. His other two companions were similarly dressed and had their names painted on their sleeves as veterans of the Mars campaign. Desmond paused before raising his fist, his hand in the air in a gesture of respect. He retreated and could not see his face through the reflective visor, it was covered in soot and smoke. He replied to the Navy with his own grin, but he couldn't see his face due to the reflectors. He raised his weapon, sent a bang into the atmosphere and looked at the flashing lights in the sky on the edge of it. If the season hadn't started with that, Davis said, trying to remember, looking up. Weber, Bellhop Renard and Tay moved towards the crater rim and three other figures emerged from the shadows and huddled around the man on the crest. Desmond said, your instructions have changed and you should forget about going ashore, sir, I'm sorry but we will have to. We can meet again, then we can wait for you, and then I'm sure you'll see us again in the next few days, he told Desmond. Desmond waved at the crater, and the massive metal of the ship melted with the sand, it would be a good place to set up camp for the night. They formed a solid wall to defend themselves against any enemies who wanted to break through or break through the fortifications. Bellhop Tay jumped out of the global to serve as a guard, and as they made their way to the line, Desmond continued his way. He scanned the empty horizon, his eyes looking for signs of life or even the slightest sign of danger from the enemy. The veteran turned and slipped out of the global, joined Weber and helped him dig a hole in the ground, and then returned to join him in his work. Weber looked over to Bellhop Tay as the men fell into the foxhole one by one and the light quickly faded. Renard joined Brooks and Jones and they talked on the radio, but the lights quickly dimmed. Desmond jumped down the slope and stood in a foxhole, wide-eyed with excitement when they finished. He looked around again before stepping aside and pulling everyone out of the hole, but they were too close to separate now. He sat up and landed on the ground, his movement bringing him to the ground on his back in front of Bellhop Tay and Renard. Weber scanned the force field and sent a shimmering glow across the top of his hiding place. Sand and dust drifted in the air, darkening the peaks with the deepening shadows of the night. Columbus joked, we will be the first human colony on Mars. But would the colony last long enough to have the thunder he ate from? Checking on his suit's reading, Dawson said, we don't have enough air to make it, but we would boil it all up. This would reduce the accumulation of CO2 in the suit, but would affect our ability to move effectively. We have 24-hour care built in, and maybe we could expand that to 28 by reducing the oxygen flow. I will have to make some calculations to see how much we should limit the flow and whether this could be achieved. The longer we sit at the landing site, the harder it becomes for us to get further, and the less oxygen we need. 
So we have to try to move forward, but what can we do and what chance do I have of moving forward if we stay here? We have no options left, so we will do what we can, move on and have a chance if I can. Dawson and Columbus both mutter, I don't answer, but I fear we'll fall behind, Columbus mutters, and Dawson nods. Rewriting of Chapter 10 Davis settled down in the sand, leaned back against the wall and leaned against it, the man undid his helmet and lay down on his lap with his helmet on. He did the same with his hands on the back of his head and his arms around his shoulders. Weber reached into his leg pocket for a few ration packs and bent down to give Davis and Renard one before tearing one. The bloody, brutal battle had set the tone for the rest of the war, ravaging hundreds of thousands of Marines. The men grunted and shook their heads, their grunting was the only sign of hope of victory in the face of such a brutal attack. Bellhop screamed out of the hole, the baby-faced boy shrugged his shoulders, his eyes lit up as he dipped into the memory. A young girl walked past 4th Street thugs sitting in a car, her face belying a world-weary attitude. A large group crowded past the car and into the parking lot, a little boy and a girl in the back seat. The tall man jerked in the alley and grabbed her by the arm, and she began to scream, but fleshy paws covered her mouth and strangled her. The other boy had strong limbs around him, his smooth soft skin scratching at the rough concrete splinter, leaving red scratches and blood marks. He attacked the girl like a wolf that surrounded prey, and she fell to the ground, her head on his chest and her body on his. Tears flowed from under the streetlights as he tore off her clothes, and she gasped for air, her eyes wide and wide with terror. Weaver unbuttoned his trousers and climbed inside, and as he pushed, a muffled cry echoed in her ear. He examined her as she struck, the boys cheered and grunted encouragingly, but he didn't. The big thug grabbed her pants and ripped them off the girl's body, and Weaver collapsed to his knees, his head in his hands and knees. Riot police had come in with batons and tasers, and as loud voices echoed through the alley, the headlights all dipped into a bright light. The last thing Weber saw before nightfall was the girl's staring eyes, and he fell onto the tarmac, his head bouncing off the black. He woke up in the cargo hold of a ship and sat up, twenty, five other convicts crowded around him. His hands were tied to one side and the pipe was tied in his hands as armed guards dragged him down the strip. The icy metal was icy and froze over his skin, but he sat still as he was handcuffed and handcuffed to his sides. Weber's feet were also tied to the floor and he tried to move them, but the men were praying while the others were crying, pleading or sitting still. If you don't shoot through the force field, you die, drop the weapon, and die within seconds or even less than a second, or you die. You go to the building on the top of the hill and choose one, and your goal is to demolish it or you die. Her face is covered by a black reflective vice that casts a distorted reflection of a convict on himself. You look almost more like an animal than a human, almost like a dog or a cat or even a human, but not like an animal. The pipe through which the man is chained comes off the wall and he slips off the hard surface of the planet while the thug groans. He steps on a small metal plate that is welded to the walls when opened, pouring its contents into the red dust on the surface of Mars. Loose clothes flutter in the wind as he trembles and trembles, his eyes wide open in terror. He stands at the foot of a hill strewn with rubble, staring at a five-story building built above it, the only sign of life. Leeks leans into an opening in the side of the building and blasts into a cargo ship that races through the force field, away from the convicts. He spies a huge generator that rests not far from Weber's position and an artificial atmosphere that spreads from his dome. One of the convicts jumps up to open his, takes a bolt from his chest and jumps into the air by opening his suitcase. The second man picks up a gun, pushes the lid off and the suitcase is thrown to the ground. The weapon rattles the ground, the explosion cuts it in half and he turns to return fire. The man pulls out his weapon and punches him in the neck, the weapon fires and it rattles to the ground. Weber notices that more and more of them are pouring out of the door, one by one they are pulling out the leaks in the building. He knelt down, grabbed the explosive device and tried to look for the weapon, but when he saw the third convict next to him, he stared at him as if he were not working. He pressed the power button, pushed it back and pressed it again, this time for a few seconds, but to no avail. Someone grabbed a gun and ran out of the building with a number of other inmates in tow, all with guns in their hands. Weber fired a shot through the door and three bolts were sent through three bodies, but he fired a shot into the next alien who then appeared next to him. Two of the inmates joined in when they returned fire from outside, but Weber knew who they were. They were outnumbered and the licks dropped off when they were picked up, so they died quickly and Weber had to be a duck. Biting smoke and the smell of burnt meat filled the apartment and clouded his vision, but he fired back. He stopped a few feet from the shooting aliens and fired until his battery ran out then crawled from boulder to boulder behind the building and searched the ground. The other two men followed him, one from behind, 
the other in front of him with his weapon in his hand and the third behind him on the ground. One of them hurled a weapon at Weber and it exploded, hitting Weber in the face and enveloping him in a red, fine mist that matched the color of the sand. Weber flipped over, checked the powerhouse and shot at the weapon cabinet below, but it triggered a fireball that rolled on impact and spread flames that slid back inside through the force field of the dome. The other inmates jumped out and fell down the stairs as he opened the door and gained access. He fell through the leak into the stairwell and ran out of the building, but the confused aliens fired at him and killed him, and he ran. The offender pushed his body against Weber as he let go of his gun, but the convicted man pushed him aside to get to the roof first. An open window collapsed as Weber and the convicts went upstairs, and he pushed their bodies back into Weber before unleashing his rifles. Weber fought the body weight, Weber pulled the explosive device of the dead man and shot the unknown man. The stairs rattled and the advancing series of leaks pushed him to the ground with a hissing, growling sound. He fell forward into the stairwell and Weaver was struggling with his body weight when Weber shot him. Weber flipped over, picked it up and crawled up the stairs, the body of the prisoner brother lay scattered on the slope, it was smoking. He crawled through the door to the roof and looked up, ready to shoot the last alien, and moved to the edge. The flames flickered and smoke billowed from the weapon's crates. He fell over on his knees and was the last man standing, he looked hard, hard looking, and he stood over the body of his brother, the brother of the prisoner and the alien. Two shuttles floated on the horizon and glided through the force field into the artificial atmosphere. The marines poured out of the open ramp doors and set up a perimeter as the second group began loading supplies. He left the building and walked up the hill, holding his gun by his side, and Weaver trudged after him as he stepped over the bodies of the surrounding men. The marines stopped work and trained their explosives technicians on soot, dirty, dirty men as they approached. Weber looked around, looked at the corpses, wiped the wound from his face, and looked down at his bloodied clothes. He looked over at each body and then back at Weaver, wide-eyed with horror. Burley pushed Weber off the command ship's ramp as it rested in the shadow of the building called the Citadel. He wanted to be in his command tent in 10 minutes, but Burley had to push him down the ramp. Rewriting of Chapter 11 Dawson lifted his weary foot out of the sand and put it back in front of him, but no air was wasted. Columbus had an air canister strapped to his leg and stretched it out and adjusted the flow to fill his suit with oxygen. He took three big breaths and said, no more walking as he walked, and Columbus grunted and fell over and stepped next to him and cranked him up and down, but he fell back again, this time on his knees, his back against the sand, his head down. He was still 20 kilometers away, but he felt the ability to think again, and the waves in the air helped him. Shortly afterwards, the sun was on the horizon, turning over his face into the sky. It turned the sky into a line of bright light, and even the stars in his vision had disappeared. The faint glow of starlight flooded him as the light increased, and it gave the shadows a life of their own. When we get there they say radio contact, but we can't find supplies, so we have to go and look for them. Anne reaches out and leans into his arm, but he loses his balance as the effort sucks the energy out of his oxygen, hungry muscles. As he struggles to get up, he hears him swearing and gasping and collapses next to his captain. Dawson stumbles off the rock and falls to his knees, and bends over him, stretching out her arms. He knew they were in enemy territory, and only luck saved them from detection, but when they got there they still needed air and shelter. They marched at a pace that would propel them to the top of the world before sunset. After a few steps Columbus reached down, turned the dial on three air canisters and knew he had reached it. During the journey across the planet towards the destroyed spaceship, only three tiny creatures had managed to get there undetected. If so, he would not have thought that his small weapon would do much to stop the executioner. Anne nodded and reached for her canister, which she turned back down, but Dawson helped her to rise and the air revived him. The click was supposed to scream out, and Anne nodded again, this time with a smile on her face and a nod from Dawson. Dawson took his tray and took the lead again, and the other two fell behind him, but not before he took off his pills and took the lead again.